On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Funding also provided by John Paul and Eloise DeJuria. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. This week's On Story, a conversation with Chris Carter, creator of The X-Files. I think all writers, uh, to some extent or another, uh, feel attracted to the misfit, to the outcast, to the person who has his own take on the world. And uh, there's a sense of injustice. And I think writers all have a very acute sense of ju justice, personal justice. And I think that that comes through in the characters that I write and that I'm attracted to. Chris Carter reveals the secret behind the success of The X-Files in a conversation with screenwriter Damon Lindelof. The X-Files was really um, incredibly scary. Um, and and, and I, I'm hard pressed to think of anything even, you know, almost a decade later uh, that is, is, is sort of unsettling as sort of an episode like Home. I just so vividly remember the, the Peacock family and the mom under the bed and, and just how, uh, it just freaked the shit out of me, fr frankly. We're to help you. We live in a scary world, so I, I, I'm scared of the same things that everyone's uh, afraid of, and I hope that I mind that uh, a lot of those fears from a kind of what I would call the general public's fears. Um, what I, I'm scared of violent death, just like everyone else, uh, and uh, so we capitalized on a, that a lot in the X Files. It really is a series of uh, paranormal murder mysteries. And uh, so it's not all that different, really, from some things that are on TV today in terms of it's, uh, e even though um, it was a scary show, it was uh, a Sherlock Holmes uh, story each and every time, yeah. I built on so much that came before. The X-Files really capitalized on uh, something that people were doing when I was a kid, which was horror and, and a scare, with Night Gallery, Twilight Zone, uh, Outer Limits. Those were shows that I, I loved and lived with as a kid. And The X-Files is the um, direct descendant of those shows. Uh, these other shows could, uh, if they're a descendant of The X-Files, um, we are part of a, a longer lineage. I know, obviously, you've spoken about Kolchak, and I, I've read uh, also that Rod Serling and The Twilight Zone were a big inspiration, but what are some of the uh, television shows, even movies or books, that you were reading sort of as, uh, as you were uh, growing up, even as a kid, that kind of went into, that really activated you as a, as a writer? It's, it's funny. Uh, the obvious answer would be The Hardy Boys, but I have a frank admission to make uh, that I actually read Nancy Drew. Um, I, I, I had a big crush on Nancy Drew, and uh, so that was what I uh, read. And I actually think that that is something I carried with me into the X Files uh, as a as sleuthing. I was interested in aliens anyway, and I had met a guy uh, when I was vacationing who was a psychologist, and he said uh, he had 
um, been given something, and he actually gave it to me later on because I needed it uh, to show it to Fox. It was called the Roper Survey, and it was a uh, scientific survey that showed that 9% of America believes in aliens and extraterrestrials, and something like 4% or 3% believe they'd actually been abducted. So I thought, that is so great, a built-in audience. <laughs> And uh, lo and behold, people were interested in aliens, and I was interested, interested in them not necessarily for their alien quality, and, but I was interested in them because it was really a great uh, entry into the supernatural and the unknown. And you could, I wanted to tell a lot of stories, uh, different stories, and I didn't want to tell just alien stories, but I knew that would be the core and ultimately the mythology that we uh, pursued. The, the way we actually uh, dealt with the mythology on the show actually came about um, by chance. Uh, if you look at the first two episodes of The X-Files, um, which is uh, the pilot and Deep Throat, they really are the first two mythology episodes. Uh, there was a, a story, EBE, that in the first season that could be considered a, 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 a mythology episode, but it, it skirted the mythology a little bit. The show that ended the um, first season, which was uh, Erlenmeyer Flask, was another uh, a rock that we built uh, this giant pile on. In the second season, we did uh, two shows called named Colony and Endgame. I got your message. Where have you been? Scully. Scully, it's me. Where are you? Scully? Are you there? And those were really the, uh, that was a sort of watershed moment where we realized we could tell two-parters and people would come back and they were actually better as two-parters than as, um, as single shows. And so we found a way to tell the mythology uh, episodes and those two-parters became a sort of uh, feature. Uh, and hallmark uh, of the show, and um, we, I was just fortunate that it worked out that way. Who was that? It's the wrong number. <clears throat> Where have you been, Mulder? I've been trying to get a hold of you. I, I was trying to reach you. I went by your house, but you weren't there. I got here as quickly as I could. Why didn't you call when you got my message? I, I, I did call. I, I couldn't get through. Put your hands against the wall. Scully, what are you doing? I you make all these choices uh, when you put together a mythology about, you know, what the characters, what the story is and what the characters are doing, how they feel about it, uh, and you sort of uh, make choices and you go down avenues. What I found in, and this happened, I think, through the, about the first four seasons, is we made all these choices and then all of a sudden the mythology kind of started to tell itself because we had made so many choices that we, you couldn't uh, duck any of them. They were uh, there to be dealt with. And it was like almost magic uh, around the fourth season that the mythology took on a, a, a really a life of its own. And I felt that during the season, uh, first season, what we were doing with the kind of uh, um, standalone episodes is they would kind of play as a uh, sort of dust your hands off at the end murder mystery and we would go on our way. But the episodes, and this actually is what led to the, I think, the power of the mythology and the uh, quality of the mythology. The episodes where Mulder and Scully were in this search for the truth, invested in the uh, characters and the idea, uh, were the best episodes. And I, I really took that to heart. It's what's scariest is, for me, and I think for the audience, is what you don't see. And so we couldn't, uh, there were limits to violence, there were limits to uh, horror and our, uh, limits to the way we could tell stories. But I thought they actually made us into more clever storytellers. How, how did you sort of apply what might be referred to as kind of the Jaws technique in right. terms of how much do you show um, in order to uh, maintain a certain level of psychological tension and horror? It, it, it really depended on the monster. I know we did an, uh, an episode where we had a monster called the Ubermensher. Uh, we really didn't see that monster well because we didn't know what that monster should really look like and nor did we know if we should see him or her. Uh, but in the Fluke Man episode, the host, you get to see the Fluke Man, you know, full form, played by Darren Morgan, by the way. Uh, and so that was a, a case where you really wanted to see the monster and so you were reward, rewarding audience expectation. So I think it really 
it was uh, up to what the monster uh, was. My distrust of authority comes from the fact that I was a child of Watergate. Uh, that happened right in my very formative years, and it was really um, a big deal to me. And All the President's Men is still one of my favorite movies, still one of the best movies ever made. And I think that uh, those things are the what fueled that um, uh, distrust of authority in for me and in the in the show also I have to say I love the movie JFK and that was something I actually played that like m other people put on music um, when they write uh, when I was doing the Erlenmeyer flask I played that in the background like music uh, just had the movie going and uh, something about the rhythms something about the uh, quality and the intensity uh, of that movie the Oliver Stone movie uh, really uh, um, spoke to me. As much as I love a good conspiracy, I just know how hard it is to do, you know, to keep a secret between three friends. <laughs> uh, so conspiracies seem to me almost uh, ridiculous in concept. Um, but we, but this idea, and it play, it still plays today. I mean, it plays in, uh, it's playing on Wall Street that there is a fix in is something that I think that Americans are particularly sensitive to. I, like most people, uh, want to believe. I, I have a sense of something greater out there. I, I always said the X-Files was, in the end, a search for God, if you will, um, small g in this case. Um, but it really was the search for answers, and uh, I still believe that, that science is actually going to be our, our way into uh, some of the most uh, philosophical uh, questions of our time. My brother is a scientist. He teaches material science at MIT. He is the scientist of the family. I love having debates with him. That could be where Mulder and Scully came from. I have to say Mulder and Scully are equal parts of me, and uh, it was, uh, I heard their voices loud and clear when I developed the show. We actually had this thing that we never imagined we would have, and we had it in spades, and it was wonderful, and ultimately the most valuable thing that we could have and preserve, which is this sexual tension between Mulder and Scully. They had never actually read together when we cast them, so we didn't know there would be that attraction, which was real. And uh, we, I, I knew that I didn't want the characters to get together because I knew that was gonna be the kiss of death. And so we somehow preserved it so that when the, the characters finally, actually, we, we cheated a lot of times. Uh, in season six, we cheated by having them kiss on the Queen Mary episode. Uh, but it was in another time period. So we actually had, we, we teased out the sexual tension and we had them kiss under the mistletoe in an episode in season six. Uh, but the characters never really got together until uh, I believe season eight of the show, so this end of season seven. I think that the humor uh, in the show was developing, uh, but it was, uh, Darren Morgan coming in and uh, doing something that uh, nobody else uh, thought of or, or even could have done, I, I don't think. I think it was such an original voice and take on the X-Files. And it was exactly at the right time when the show was uh, getting a little, um, it, it had become very popular and maybe a little, uh, ran the risk of being a little bit too, uh, taking itself a little bit too seriously. So I think it was a really uh, fortunate thing, first of all, to have Darren around, second of all, that he did that episode. The original risk was taken with this episode called Humbug in the second season, and that was a Darren Morgan show. And it also was very self-aware. It made Mulder uh, into something of a fool, um, which was a risky thing to do. 21st century genetic engineering will not only eradicate the Siamese twins and the alligator skin people, but you're going to be hard pressed to find a, a slight overbite or not so high cheekbone. You see, I've seen the future, and the future looks just like him. Imagine going through your whole life looking like that. But Darren Morgan's episodes always pushed us way, f pushed us far out of our comfort zone, and it really pushed the. Um, the network and the studio out of the comfort zone. And when we did Humbug, they actually made us market test uh, the show uh, to make sure that people would laugh at our next files. And when people loved it, you know, they, they aired it and it was fine. Um, but uh, Jose Chunks from Outer Space is 
I, I think there were probably a lot of people who didn't get that sh that episode. I think that there are a lot of X-Files fans. In fact, I know uh, one of the biggest X-Files fans didn't like any of the Darren Morgan episodes. When, and I think that they're all some of the best episodes that we ever did. So there was something for everyone. And uh, we were giving, we were expanding our range and lightening the show in a way that it did need to be lightened because it couldn't have gone on as the intense show that it was for nine seasons. Hi, I'm Marysia Makowska. And I'm Todd Samudovia. We are the writers and directors of the short film Sea Pavilion. The idea for the short film was conceived while we were living in Cape Town, South Africa. One day we were looking for a place to go on a short trip and while I was browsing online I found this amazing location. We want the story to entertain the audience, but we also want to send the audience away with a sense of curiosity. Instead of uh, wrapping it up with a neat conclusion, we tried to pose a question at the end. Another thing is the music. We're very happy with how it ended up. Coming up next is our short film, Sipa Video. We hope you enjoy it and thank you for watching.